I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey, Street Walkers. Keep listening after the episode for the first five-minute episode of Subterra, a scripted science fiction podcast written by Warren Davis and Stephen Kruger and narrated by Marty Yu. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Will Blaine. Will Blaine is an author who lives in Columbus, Ohio, and works in Chillicothe. Listeners of this show know of my fascination with Chillicothe, Ohio, so of course I wasted no time bringing that up. I love that place so much. So we do chat about Chillicothe for a little bit. We also talk about where Will grew up and some of the adventures he got into as a troublemaking stuntman wannabe kid before finally talking about his writing. We talk about the impetus for him beginning his writing again after taking a many years long break. And we talk about his new short story, Vlad and the Vast Beach, which is part of his series of wildly inappropriate stories for children available on Amazon. I had a lot of fun talking to Will. I'm sure we'll be talking more in the future offline. And I can't wait to check out his story, Vlad and the Vast Beach. So all of you run, don't walk. And go check out that story as well. This was recorded during all the self-distancing due to the coronavirus outbreak. So if that is over by now, woohoo. If not, damn it. But either way, and this is my conversation with author Will Blaine. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Will Blaine. How are you doing today, Will? I'm doing great. It's good to see you. Oh, it was good to talk to you too, man. Hey, um, just out of curiosity, it, so Blaine is a, I'm assuming it's a family last name, right? You're not the only one. It is. That's good. There's kind of an interesting story to that too. My name is spelled B-L-A-I-N-E, but I'm not related to anybody that spells their name that way. So all of my relatives, their last name is spelled B-L-A-I-N. And how is that? Like, how come? Why did you get an E? Right. My grandfather had his spelling changed on his birth certificate, and everybody since then has had it changed. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So my son, I named him Blaine. Really? That's his first name. Well, his second name. His name is Stephen Blaine. And you spell it with the E? No, I spell it with a Y, B-L-A-Y-N-E. Oh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm just crazy. That is unusual. It is unusual. So, Will, enough about my kid. <laughs> Where were you born and raised, man? Where'd you grow up? I was born in rural West Virginia. I grew up on a farm along the Ohio River. Back in those days, it was not too many neighbors around. You could see the river and you could see the mountains from my house. Is that the Appalachian Mountains? Yeah, at the, at the foothills, right. Oh, nice. So I'm assuming that that's not where you are now? No, I live in Columbus, Ohio now. I've lived all over the place, but I eventually settled. I've lived in Columbus for about 10 years now. I've lived in California for a while. I've lived in different places in Ohio and, and West Virginia for a little while. So and I travel a lot. So I spend extended vacations in different places, too. So what initially led you to leave Virginia? I turned 18 and I just left home and I moved to the Silicon Valley. To do what? Well, I got married there. That's where I, I, I first got married. And uh, my wife was, her family was from that area. Oh, gotcha. What circumstances led you to wind up? in Columbus, Ohio? Well, that's kind of related to the book. I started learning the Russian language in 2009, and there was a group in Columbus that uh, spoke Russian, and they kind of mentored me and helped me to learn and things like that. That's kind of the, the foundation for why I wrote the book initially, the, for the first story about Vlad and the Vast Beach. Before we get to the book, why were you learning Russian? That's an interesting thing. I found out that everybody that's my age and older grew up under the Soviet Union in Russia. So that means that they were raised in an atheistic society. Now, most people don't understand what that's like. I've talked to friends and stuff like that that were raised up in the Soviet Union, and they would uh, do things that would seem kind of odd to us, like have gatherings, like at school, and there'd be hundreds, even thousands of students, and they'd chant all together, Nyet Volga, Nyet Volga, Nyet Volga. That means there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. It was kind of like instilled and pounded into their heads that 
God didn't exist. That was just the nature of the government, I guess. They were raised like that. They didn't have access to a lot of things we take for granted in the United States, and the least of which probably is religion. They had a lot of other things that they were restricted from. But that's what I do. I, I dedicate a lot of time to volunteering, to teaching the Bible to individuals that are interested in learning in the Russian language. In the Columbus area, there's, I think it's around 14,000 people or so that are Russian language speakers. Next to Spanish, it's the largest language group in the United States. Russian? A foreign language, yes. Next to Spanish. Whoa! So you gotta you got to understand, there's huge areas of the United States that are only Russian-speaking. So the story that I wrote is inspired by my trips that I've taken to the Brighton Beach area in Brooklyn, New York, like in New York City, right? So if you go to Brighton Beach, it's like little Moscow. Everything's Russian. The stores are Russian. The restaurants are Russian. All the people are Russian. Everybody's speaking Russian. It's just like a Chinatown for Russian-speaking folks. Yeah, you know, most people don't. They've never been, never been there, and I understand that. But there are areas of the country where it's totally saturated with Russian-speaking people. I had no idea. Yes. So let's just take Columbus for example. There's a large Russian-speaking population there. Do they also speak English? Most do, uh, and most individuals that are of uh, satellite states, even if they can speak Russian, they won't speak Russian. So if I talk to a Ukrainian person, for instance. I'll say something like, we go to the Pruski, ask if they speak Russian. And they'll answer me, niet, which means no in Russian. But obviously they speak Russian, but they're saying they don't speak Russian, as in they're not going to. They'll speak Ukrainian, but not Russian. And that goes back to a lot of the political situation that's going on over in Crimea and the Black Sea area where the Soviet, well, I guess they're Russians now, kind of annexed part of the uh, Ukrainians' territory. And they've been kind of fighting over there for quite a few years now, over that little territory. So they were not pleased when the Soviets took them over and annexed their country and forced them to speak Russian. So it's kind of like their own little rebellious political pride type thing that they do. Most Ukrainian people can speak some Russian that are my age and older, because that's what they were taught in school exclusively. Wow. I sort of feel their pain. I used to live in uh, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh And while we were living there, the city of Louisville annexed our neighborhood. Right. And then forced us to pay city taxes. Exactly. Yes. So we moved back to Texas. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's that's exactly what they were doing. I mean, only they did that on a, a very large scale. Yeah. They controlled every aspect of your life. That's crazy. You don't have to say, but what do you do for a living in Columbus? I don't work in Columbus. I work in Chillicothe. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I work for a large truck manufacturer. Oh, I know who it is. I drive right past it every time I go to the Sugarloaf Mountain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's right in the back. I go up there all the time. I go running there in the after work. I, I work nights, and in the mornings, I get off, get off work, and I, I run the trails up there. Why are you running? Is someone chasing you? <laughs> no, I'm just trying to fight age. You know, I'm, I'm turning 50 this year, so I'm not liking what it does to your body. So I'm trying to keep in a little bit of a semblance of good shape. Gotcha. Listeners of this show know that uh, once a year, my wife and I travel to the great Chillicothe, Ohio to check out Tecumseh. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. We love it. We've done it three years in a row. As soon as we heard about it, some friends of ours live in Chillicothe, Uh and they were telling us about it, and we were like, what? That sounds amazing. And so we've done it every year you know, since we heard about it, which is three, and I guess we're probably not going to be able to do it this year. (laughs) Yeah, they really clamp down on events around here, even at work. I worked last night and got off at 7.15 this morning, but they shut down for the next couple of days, not because they don't want us to work. It's just that all of our suppliers are not working, so they don't have enough supplies in order to continue building trucks. So we'll see what happens. We do need to build trucks. I mean, as, as far as the United States is concerned, you know, we have a lot of customers that are big clients, you know, Amazons and FedEx and UPS. We build trucks for them, and they certainly need to deliver supplies. And that's, just, that's kind of a key business that needs to keep going. Yeah, they'll have to figure something else out with that because those are definitely essential services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How long have you lived in Chillicothe? Well, I don't live in Chillicothe oh, I'm myself. Sorry, yeah. I live in Columbus. I've worked in Chillicothe for 23, 25 years, something like that. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Yeah, I've worked there a long time. Oh, congrats. Yeah. So what did you want to be when you grew up, Will? Early on, I wanted to be a lot of things, you know, the common firefighter, postman, 
stuff like that. As I got to be a teenager, I wanted to be a stunt man and, you know, other a little more dangerous things. We had horses growing up, so I was kind of having adventures on them. I do a lot of things that my parents didn't want me to do. I can remember one particular occasion. The county had built a had put a water line in. When we when I grew up, we didn't have county water. We had a just had a regular well. But the you know I was probably sixteen or so. They put, the county put water in, and they put a a trench in the front yard. You know, our front yard was was pretty extensive. So I'd taken my horse and I'd. I, my parents didn't like me to run it because back in those days, you didn't have helmets or armor or anything like that. It was just, you know, just had my saddle and that was it. If I fell, then you know, it looks like you're going to get some serious injury. So I had in my mind with this whole stuntman mentality that I'm going to have my horse jump this trench that they had dug for the for the water line. It was less than a foot wide. It was not not very big. But I got there and I had my horse at almost a full run. And she was coming up on the uh, trench, and I could see it coming. I set my knees on the sides of the saddle and set my feet in the stirrups, leaned forward onto the horn, and get, got ready for the horse to jump. And at the last minute, she put the brakes on, and she must have dug her hoofs into the ground better than six inches. And I went flying across her head onto the other side of that trench. And I ate grass, and I had grass embedded into my arms and face and everything else for, for weeks after that. I remember it was kind of a surreal thing with the ground coming closer and closer to you as you're falling like that. And I can remember looking back at the horse, and the horse was just looking down into the trough like something was going to get out, come out of there and, and get her. You know, She was scared. And I can remember looking back and thinking, you stupid horse. You could have just stepped over that trench, and she wouldn't do it. So I I can remember going back there and grabbing the reins and trying to pull her across, and she wouldn't go. I ended up walking her back to the barn. But that was one of my experiences and probably a turning point in my thoughts about becoming a stuntman at that point in my life because it was not very pleasant. I had many occasions where I could have gotten seriously hurt or killed from doing stuff like that. Well, good on you for knocking that stuff off. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So when did you figure out that you could put pen to paper and come up with words? You know, I've always written. I can remember as a kid even writing, and I, I had a, a lot written a lot of stuff and had a collection of notebooks and things like that for quite a number of years. I don't know, probably 10, 15 years ago, I suppose, I thought, oh, this is kind of ridiculous, and I threw it all away. Now I wish I hadn't, but I had not written anything in, in quite a while. I got divorced around about that time, and I eventually got remarried, and for my first anniversary, I thought, you know, what would be a good thing? Because, you know, we have everything we need. I thought, you know, it would be nice to write a poem. So I wrote her a poem for our first anniversary. And that's how I got back into writing. And I've been writing again ever since. Really? That was the impetus for you to start writing again? Yep, that was it. That's a beautiful story. Yep. Since then, I mean, I, mean, I don't write a lot of poetry like, like that. I mean, I, I do some, but most of my stories are, you know, it's like the one, the series that I'm working on right now is called uh, Wildly Inappropriate Stories for Children. So it's mostly short stories, mostly rhyming. They have a little lesson in it. And they're just little fun stories about things that children do that we don't want them to do, basically. You know, wander away from our parents, jump in mud puddles, stuff like that, you know. What made you decide to write in that genre? Why do, Why are you writing children's stories? I have uh, nieces and nephews, and I was just reflecting on raising my daughter. You know, I was a single parent for a little while, and I've always had a really good relationship with my daughter. And I was just kind of reflecting on all the things that she did as a child and all the things that I did as a child as well, all the stuff that I got away with. And I'm sure that my parents would have had early gray hair if they knew all the things that I was doing that they didn't know of. (laughs) So, you know, and I think it's a very relatable subject too. I think everybody can remember somewhat of the things that they did as a child or most people were parents or have been parents getting along with all of the things that kids do. You know, I'm, I'm writing a story I just started it uh, the other day. It's about little boys, you know, after they get potty trained, they learn to pee on different things. Most parents try to get that as a kind of an incentive for them to use a bathroom, right? So they'll say, pee on the tree, pee on the bush, pee on this or that. And most children that I know of have taken that to an extreme. I was talking to some of the guys I work with. One of the guys was relating an experience with his nephew. He had gone through the gates of Disneyland. They were walking on the Broadway with the castle in view, you know. And his nephew tells his mother, hey, mom, I got to go to the bathroom. He's like three years old. And she's like, "Okay, like, okay, I'm going to take you to the bathroom. He took it as, "Okay, go ahead and do it. So he's peeing out in the middle of the Broadway of of Disneyland. It's just very 
little boy thing to do, peeing on something. You know, I, I can remember several things that I peed on as a child, and I'm sure everyone, every male can anyway, can very much relate to that story. Well, for those listening who don't pee standing up, <laughs> uh, let me just say that it doesn't stop there. Every person, I, every man I know, the moment they owned their own home, the very first thing they did was piss in the front or backyard, either one. <laughs> it's a common thing. It's very common. There's nothing wrong with it. I, you know, just kind of be discreet. Unless you're near a school, then there's nothing right. wrong with it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. They don't take you kindly to doing that in Columbus. So I have yeah, to I bet. until I go back in the rural someplace. Yeah, do it in Chillicothe. They got no rules. Right, right. Uh, so what's the name of the book again, Will? The first story that I've written is it's available now. It's called Vlad and the Vast Beach. Vlad and the Vast Beach. Right. So Vlad is a very common Russian name. Sure. So the inspiration for that story, as I mentioned before, is I went to the Brighton Beach area and I'd walk from you know, Brighton Beach on the north to Coney Island. Most people are familiar with Coney Island and everything that you're seeing there is everything's in Russian. All the people that are on the beach, or majority of them are Russian, and, and they have their kids with them and different things like that. And I just thought about some of the things that happen with people I know that you know their children wander away from them and get lost and freaks the parents out and things like that. So this, that's basically what the story is about. The little boy wanders off and has a little bit of adventure by himself. Hey, streetwalkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. <sighs> It is 2140. You are trapped in an underground bunker. Built a century ago to protect mankind from the pandemic on the surface. Now ruled by tyrants and their robot army. You are an outcast, an orphan, a scavenger, blind, afraid, and alone. You are Ace, a survivor, and you will try to escape this place, this place known as Subterra. Subscribe to Subterra at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download podcasts. Let's get back into it. How long are all of these stories going to be? They're very short stories. Now, they're intended for kids and their parents. And again, I have the series entitled Wildly Inappropriate Stories for Children because they're really not appropriate for impressionable children. I wrote a story a few months ago. It's called The Brat with a Bat. It was about a little person that gets a new baseball bat and goes around smashing things. So I was over at my friend's house, and he has a little boy that's maybe five years old. And he heard the story and a few minutes later felt compelled to get a stick and start smashing things in his house. So that's what we don't want. Don't want to get any kids in trouble or anything like that. So definitely not for impressionable kids. But, you know, once they get a little more reasoning to them, they're very entertaining stories. And how many of these stories are going to eventually be in this series? There's probably around 20 ideas that I have that I'm working on. And I've written probably 10 so far. Oh, cool. And you're just releasing them one at a time? Yeah, I'm just going to release them one at a time. I'm eventually going to work with an illustrator and maybe get a collaborated book, kind of like an Aesop's Fables type thing, maybe, and have it illustrated and all that kind of thing. But that's in, that's in the works, and it might be sometime down the road. Very cool. Do you already have an illustrator in mind? I do. I do. Cool. I have a couple in mind, in fact. Where are these stories available? So I'm selling them on Amazon right now. I was just up in my studio uh, just a minute ago recording some audio. They're going to be available on Audible soon. So I have it in ebook format, and it's also just released the paperback this week. Nice. And is it the, the whole book, or is it so far just Vlad? Just Vlad. It's just Vlad and the Vast Beach. It's the individual story. Uh, what kinds of other stories are there? Is uh, Brat with a Bat going to be in there? Yeah, I'm going to release it individually by itself. The next one that's coming out in the series is called Sticky Fingers from Jam. So this is another thing that kids commonly do is they wake up way before their parents do and come downstairs and decide to make themselves breakfast. I'm sure that you have had the experience, if you have children, that they make quite a mess in doing so. You're not wrong. 
<laughs> right. And I think every parent's had that experience at one point in our life. And I, I can remember doing the same thing once or twice as a child. In fact, the real inspiration for that story was when I was young on the farm, my cousin that lived behind me in the house, and I had to do my chores, which are out at the barn that was behind the house. So I have to walk past his house in order to get there. It was like, I don't know, maybe six or seven o'clock in the morning, something like that. And I think it was during the summertime. So he was two or three years old, maybe. And he emerges from the cornfield and he is covered from head to toe in sugar. And he announces that he made himself breakfast and he was really proud of himself. Now, at that time, maybe I was nine, something like that, 10. I didn't really think anything of it. But, you know, in hindsight, I would have loved to see what his kitchen looked like. And his parents were probably livid. If he had that much sugar on him, I can't imagine how much was around his kitchen and the rest of the house. I want to know what he made, man. <laughs> I have no recollection of that. I can just remember him coming out of the cornfield covered in sugar. That is how horror movies begin. Yeah, I can imagine all the problems that's going to cause. Well, yeah, no kidding. So you said it's going to be about 20 stories. Half of them you have basically written already. What are you going to do after this? What is your future for your writing? Are you going to try to turn it into a full-time career or are you just going to keep doing it part-time what's your goal for your writing well i'm planning on retiring in about five years and i i don't know i'm not looking to be like ultra famous or something like that but it might be some supplemental income to have for the stories that would be great that's really all i have planned i don't plan on being rich and famous or anything that's how i originally got to publish them is because everybody was saying hey what you ought to put this on amazon or you ought to sell this book I'd read the stories to my friends and coworkers and neighbors and things like that. And they're like, oh, this is great. You got to sell this. So that's where I got the idea initially. How did you find the process of getting your first works on Amazon and Audible? Oh, that was a chore. There's a website. It's called KDP, I think it is. So they give you uh, detailed instructions about what to expect and rules and formatting guidelines and everything that you could imagine. There's a lot of reading and research involved. But I think anybody can do it. It just takes a little bit of time. And how has the reception been so far? It's been well. I mean, I'm not famous or wealthy or anything like that. But, yeah, I've sold a few books and everybody seems to like them. A lot of positive feedback about it. Very nice. And so do you have your own author page on Amazon? I do. It's www.amazon.com slash authors slash Will Blaine. It's like my name. Oh, cool. So are your friends and family leaving reviews and things like that? I don't think so. I really haven't checked. I think one of my friends has put one on there the last time I checked, but I, I haven't checked it lately. You should definitely put a call out because, believe it or not, that really, really does help the algorithms and whatever the heck help people find your stories. And part of the way it does it is the people who leave reviews, the system sees what else they've left reviews on. And so uh -huh. on some of those other things, it'll say, you know, customers also liked this or also bought that or whatever. Oh, okay. That's part of how all that works. So make sure to tell your friends and family to say a little something, something. And all of you listening should go check out that story for sure and write a review. I want to go back to your first anniversary with your wife. I believe that the anniversary is paper. Yes, I think it is. I think it is. And so you gave her a poem. Now, up to this point, I'm assuming since you knew this woman, you hadn't written anything, right? Right. So what was her reaction? And by that, I mean, was she surprised that you could write? And also, was she just blown away at that sweet gesture? <laughs> Well, she really did like it. Abby's kind of a person that's, that's unique, of course. You know, I thought that would be biased by saying that. But uh, some things I do appreciate about her that makes her different. It's like when we first got in our first disagreement, I don't even remember what it was, but I loved her response. I took one position and she took another position, and we were not inclined to budge from our viewpoint. So before the debate got very heated, she's like, hey, uh, let's write a spreadsheet about it. You know, I don't know how many women would say, hey, let's not argue, let's write a spreadsheet. But that's one thing I love about her. She's very logical minded, very down to earth and doesn't get overly emotional about things. So did she get overly emotional about that poem? She didn't. And that's that's her MO, though. She liked it, definitely. And she's kept it. Oh, I'm glad she kept it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but it's a special thing. And she does like it. And, you know, I didn't expect her to gush over it or anything like that. Well, that is cool. Do you remember what she got you for your first anniversary? I don't. I'm going to cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> no, when we got married, she got me some wedding gifts and stuff like that that were very nice. 
I don't know. I don't really need anything. I, and I didn't expect her to get me anything. I, I'm not really big on presents. Right? And I, I, I don't really like the idea of getting something because it's an occasion. Most people feel compelled to give their spouse something for their birthday or for Christmas or for Valentine's Day. I just don't like the idea of feeling compelled to get something because it's an occasion. So it's like last week, I brought my wife flowers. I got her roses. There was no occasion. I just loved my wife and brought her flowers. It doesn't say the same thing as if it was February 14th and it's Valentine's Day and you buy her flowers. You're compelled to do that. That's an expectation. That's not showing love in my viewpoint. You do things and get gifts for your spouse or people that you love because you love them, not because it's a particular day. I like it. I wish more people were like that. Yeah. It's not like I don't give her good gifts. I do. I like giving gifts. I like giving good gifts to my family, my friends. And it's not going to be because it's at a particular occasion. It's going to be because I love them. Nice. So what does she think about you writing these stories? She was actually quite supportive. She is a copywriter. So she helped me a lot. So I kind of messed up with the ebook formatting. I did that by myself and put it together for the first edition. And I didn't give any consideration to how it was presented on the page. And apparently that's a big deal. And now that I've printed the book, it is a big deal. The printed edition of the book looks much better than the ebook. So when you're a um, copy editor and you're looking at how the page breaks, what words it's going to end in, how the letters are spaced. The space between letters is called kerning. You give attention to that. I didn't care. I thought that's automatically done. Well, apparently it's not. So if you have an it's, I-T apostrophe S, the space between the apostrophe and the S looks a great deal different. If you adjust that space in between, it's called kerning, and you can make it smaller or larger based on what you're doing with a particular page in the book. So it makes it a lot more readable, a lot more aesthetically pleasing on the page. And I didn't give any consideration to that when I first wrote the ebook. Is this something that she talked you through or uh, how, how does that relate to her being a copywriter? We had a Google Doc that we're working actively off of, and she has a program that she uses also. I forget what it's called, but she'll format it, and she'll ask me questions, and I'll have to respond to her, and it goes through several revisions before it actually gets published. I didn't do that first process with the ebook, but I did for the paperback, and I think it's a much better product. Gotcha. So I asked you about the process of getting it on Amazon and doing the, um, the audiobook. How is the process of getting a printed book? It's similar. One thing that I didn't expect when I was first making it is I didn't give consideration to the cover. So you know, how are you going to convey what's in the book? So having to have that vision and, and what you're going to do with it, there's literally limitless possibilities for that. So I had to figure out something that I liked and then, of course, something that I could do. And I ended up with a picture of the beach, like under the water, like on the beach. It makes little patterns from the currents receding. Mm -hmm. So that's what the front of it looks like, little beach sand. Initially, I had the vision of having a picture of Brighton Beach from the south facing north with New York City in the background. But maybe I'll do that in a future book, but I didn't do that in the initial one. Gotcha. Do you have a website? I don't have an actual website. I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. And I think I have a Facebook page. You can probably find me on Facebook, too. I think that's my personal one, but I'm using it for the business anyway. And, of course, my Amazon author page. But I, I am working on a website. I just haven't finished it yet. And so on Instagram and LinkedIn, people can just search Will Blaine? Yeah, I'm Curious Mind of Will on Instagram. And I think that's also on LinkedIn. You can look for either Will Blaine or Curious Mind of Will. So that's my business name is Curious Mind of Will. So you can look for me there. Mostly on Instagram is where I'm going to post upcoming events, releases of books, releases of audio, podcasts that I'm on like this one. I'm going to put all of them on there. So if you guys want to follow that one, that would be awesome. Cool. Now, you mentioned earlier that you know before you sort of settled down in Columbus, you traveled kind of a lot. Or sometimes you still travel, maybe? I do. I just got back last summer. I spent a month in Europe. We stopped over in Portugal, then went to Germany, then Switzerland, then to Italy, and then Croatia and bounce back to Ireland before coming home. So, yeah, we spent an entire month over there. It was pretty awesome. Was this for work? No, we just we had planned to go to a convention, which we did, but that was just a few days. And then we decided, well, well, since we're over here, we might as well stay a while. 
So we toured around Germany for a long time. They have a, a lot of cool things in Berlin and different cities. I didn't even realize how awesome it was and how picturesque Germany and Switzerland were. My, matter of fact, my wife and I were in Switzerland in the Alps. We decided that we're going to hike up to about 5,400 feet. And as we're looking back down, we can see a little villages where we started down below is, you know, we're at 5,400 feet. So we're pretty high up in the, in the Alps. And as we're looking down, we're looking down and two fighter jets fly by. And we're looking down on top of them. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. I don't know many people that have looked down on the top of two fighter jets while they're in flight. That's pretty impressive. And also impressive that Switzerland has fighter jets. Well, I thought the same thing. I thought that <laughs> these guys were really militaristic, but apparently they are. They have their own military and they seem fairly formidable. It was a very stark contrast between the way of life in Switzerland and when I went to Italy. So when we were there in, in the middle of June in Switzerland, we were hiking in the Alps and there was still snow on the ground. It was above freezing for the most part. I mean, during the day anyway, you know, for a hike and everything. It was still passable, obviously, but there was still snow on the ground. And I don't think I saw a policeman or a military person aside from the fighter jets the entire time I was there. The train system is awesome. The get on the train and we're going from Switzerland to Italy, it's doing 185 miles an hour. I mean, I couldn't even stick my phone and get a picture out the window without it being blurred. It was going so fast, even in the distance. I couldn't get a good photo. So when we stepped off the train in Milan, it felt like somebody was taking a hairdryer and blowing it directly in our face. It was like 104 degrees outside. And the first thing that I noticed when I stepped out is there was soldiers with automatic weapons all over the place. It seems like every half block there was soldiers with automatic weapons. And... I don't know. It just It's a very stark contrast between those two countries. And they're really not that far apart. It's a couple hours by train. It's, just, it's like night and day difference. That's pretty crazy. Um, my wife and I went to Paris and Rome a couple of years ago. And when we landed in Paris and we got to the, like, we're walking in the airport and there's just dudes walking around in fatigues carrying machine guns. And we were yeah. like, what the hell is happening? Right. And so we asked somebody, we're like, what's going on? What's going on? And they're like, well, nothing. This is the capital. I was like, what does that mean? They're like, it's a capital. It is secure. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. We went to Rome, too, and that place was chaos. There were so many people, and there were so many setups to avoid people taking a truck and driving it through a crowd or something like that. Big barricades and things like that were set up on almost all the streets. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was unsettling just because I was American, but it seems like it's the standard for most big cities anymore. Yeah, it kind of does seem like that. Luckily, when we went to uh, Paris and Rome, it was before driving into crowds of people was cool. Right. But as we're heading out, Will, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time to let us all get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. And I, I wanted to ask you, is there anything we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? No, I just want to plug my book, you know, and I really enjoyed having time to sit down and talk with you and really enjoyed myself. Absolutely. So again, the name of the book is Wildly Inappropriate Stories for Children. And the first story, which is available at Will Blaine's author page on Amazon, is called Vlad and the Vast Beach. Yeah, so the series is Wildly Inappropriate Stories for Children. There you go, the series. Sorry, I called it a book, but the series. My apologies. No problem. So make sure and reach out and follow Will on Instagram and LinkedIn and go look for him on Facebook. I'm sure it's there somewhere. And keep checking. That website will be there soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I still work full time, so this is kind of like a part time gig. I have limited time to write stories and make sure that I publish them and get the audio done and all that kind of stuff. So maybe when I retire, I'll have a little more time to dedicate to it. Hey, I know how you could find more time. <laughs> get laid off. Stop all that foolish running. What's that <laughs> all about? Well, I decided last year that I'm not going to. I was keeping track of my time and trying to get down to about five and a half minutes per mile. And I thought, you know, I, I don't need to do that. I'm going to end up hurting my knee or, or ankle or something like that on these trails. And I decided, you know, I'm going to run what I want to, just stay active. And if I want to stop and take a picture or look at the scenery for a little bit, I'm going to do that. So I just, you know, I run, but I'm not going to do like I did when I was a teenager and just see how fast I can go. I'm just going to take it a little more easy. Yeah. And don't try to jump any horses. Well, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> All right, Will. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time, man. It was a pleasure to speak with you and, and hang out a little bit. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. You have a great rest of your day, man. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, guys. If you're like me, quarantine or not, you and your family are looking for new things to do together that don't involve staring at a screen. I have the perfect solution. 
It's a new trivia game called You Know It, and it's a blast, and you can try it for free. You Know It was created by John Sylvain, one of the hosts of the Nooner Podcast on Kevin Smith's Smodcast Podcast Network. And since I'm a fan of that podcast, I signed up for an early copy when John launched his Kickstarter campaign. Really, I just wanted to be supportive, but my family and I played the game, and we loved it. Days later, everybody kept saying how fun it was. It's a very simple game. The rules are even simpler than Trivial Pursuit, but there's a lot of strategy to it as well, and the questions are fun and interesting and sometimes hilarious. And all of the questions have two parts, so maybe you don't know the first part, but maybe you know the second part, or vice versa, like this one. What name is shared by a California NBA team and a California NHL team? The Kings. They're not all easy like that, but some of them are. There's wild cards and strategy and stealing and even consequences for getting an answer wrong. One of my favorite parts about this game is that there's three questions on each card, three rounds plus maybe a tiebreaker for each game. Like when me and my family played, there was four of us and it took 45 minutes to an hour and we only used six cards and there's so many cards. We could play this game forever. Now I'm not suggesting that you have to be drinking to play this game. But me and my family were, and I tell you what, it raises the fun level to 11. I highly recommend you try it, and you can do that for free by going to youknowitthegame.com, all one word, no spaces, and you can download and print a starter pack for free. There's also more cards available for science and sports, and even a special Generation Z pack. And if free isn't cheap enough for you, Streetwalkers can get 30% off on all other downloadable packs by using the discount code FSTREET at checkout. Once again, that's youknowitthegame.com, all one word, no spaces, and use the discount code FSTREET at checkout for 30% off all other downloadable packs. And if I'm being honest, Streetwalkers, I'm a little upset that I only got one copy of this game. My kids are adults, and they deserve a copy of this game so they can play with their friends too. Remember, the game is called You Know It, and it's a blast. Subterra, Episode 1 From his hiding place in a rocky alcove, high above the square, Ace watched the busy market. Hundreds of people, citizens and vendors, were down there, buying goods, trading goods, laughing, arguing, and going about their business completely unaware that Ace was watching them. Ace was used to hiding in the shadows. He was a bunker orphan, an outcast. He never felt welcome in the chute, and the other facilities of Subterra were also off-limits to him and the other outcasts. But he needed to come here sometimes. There were things he needed that he couldn't find scavenging in the barrens or the lower levels. So here he was on market day. Ace wore a ragged, dirty jumpsuit. The backpack was slung over his shoulder. His eyes were hidden by his optics goggles, the most expensive item he owned. Without his goggles, Ace had a hard time seeing anything. He guessed most people would have called him blind. Though he could see things without his goggles, things were fuzzy and dim. The goggles were necessary, and without them, he might as well be dead. He adjusted his goggles and locked in on the spare parts vendor. He was an older man, about 50, dressed in simple robes, and he was haggling with a younger man over the price of a broken ventilator mask. The stall had shelves that were packed with various parts, and most of them looked like junk. Most of them were junk. But there was one item that Ace keyed on, a power pack resting on the top shelf. That was what he was there for. Ace saw that the market was brightly lit. He looked up, but there was no sky overhead. There was a crosshatch of steel beams that ran the length of a large rocky ceiling. There were three xenon lights that ran the length of the large chamber. They produced a soft but very radiant light that illuminated the entire square. In theory, they were almost as powerful as the sun, producing almost 80,000 lux. But that was just theory and hearsay. Nobody had seen the sun for over a hundred years. Ace turned his attention back to the market stalls. He had no money, nothing to barter with, at least nothing he wanted to part with. So he was going to steal it. The vendor was still arguing, 
waving his arms around wildly as he harangued the man who looked at the mask with a disapproving snarl on his lips. Ace switched to setting on his optics again and scanned the market, sweeping the area for signs of security. They were there, of course. Two sentries with a Mass 7 bot were standing next to a stall with a vendor selling some dehydrated fruit. He looked up and saw cameras embedded high up in the rock ceiling. There was no way for him to know if they were operational or not. But that didn't really matter. Nobody knew his face here. He wasn't chipped. There was no way for them to track him. He was going to have to deal with the Mass 7, though. It could track his heat signature, even in the dark. And if it got a hold of him, it was all over, and he would be finished. But he didn't really have any choice. He was finally getting out of this place. He was going to see the sun for the first time in his life. He had made his plans and theorized and put all of his supplies together. He was going to leave this place and never come back. Now it was time to do something about it, to take action. And it all started with that power pack. He slid over the edge of the rock shelf and lowered himself down until he was just holding onto the edge with his fingertips. Then he dropped a few feet to the next outcropping. He traversed the rock face carefully, pausing to make sure nobody was looking in his direction, then made his way down to the market. He dropped the last few feet and landed on the mesh grate floor with a soft thud. He was behind one of the market tents, out of view from the vendors and other market patrons. He dusted himself off, pulled his cloak tightly around him, and flipped up his hood to hide his face. Then, he stepped out into the market. One way or another, this would all be over in a few minutes. Subterra was created by Warren Davis and Steve Kruger. Performed by Marty Yu. As always, thanks for listening, Streetwalkers. And don't forget, follow the show on Twitter at FascinationSTPD, on Instagram at FascinationStreetPod. Follow the podcast page on Facebook at Fascination Street Podcast. And of course, you can always email me at FascinationStreetPod at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and rate us on iTunes. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street. 